Hey y'all, this is Chris Johnson at Living Waters Fly Fishing with another online fly tying tutorial. Today we're going to be tying the Texas Tickler. It's a fly that was developed by a good friend of mine, Jake McKittrick. He used to rep for Montana Fly Company down here in Texas, and now he's concentrated more of his efforts near his home territory in the western states. But he came into the shop one time, we were kind of talking over flies and you know stuff for the upcoming new year and things of that sort, and he was asking specifically what do we need to offer through Montana Fly Company for Texas and kind of the southern states? And I simply replied, it's got to be small, have a lot of legs, move like crazy, kind of look like a damselfly, dragonfly nymph, and the fly needs to ride hook up. He took some notes, and this is what he came up with. I think it's an absolutely amazing pattern. It is called the Texas Tickler. This thing is a bundle of motion. It does an exceptional job of, you know, riding upright. Sinks at a very, very good sink rate because we got a little tungsten bead with some brass eyes underneath it. Also caused the fly to actually sit upright with the tail kind of uh, more, more of like in a headstand position. Got dual sets of rubber legs, hen hackles, the whole nine yards. This thing is just an absolute fireball when you throw it into uh, any hill country creek or stream. Carp, bass, you know, anything, cichlid, sunfish, they're gonna eat it. Uh, in the manufactured version, it comes at a 10 and a 14. So it can be downsized to very, very small sizes. Uh, pine squirrel zonker is pretty easy to downsize if you need to get it in a smaller profile. And the rest of the steps aren't too difficult as essentially it's just kind of a beefed up nymph. So we're gonna walk through how to tie one of these today, help you uh, put a few of these in your box, and I know you'll love the results as soon as you hit the river. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna pop this guy out. Um, the, the fly that I'm actually, the hook that I'm using rather, this is actually a size 10 in a uh, Hannock 490 BL. So pretty stout, it's gonna be very heavy wire. Um, I, I would just say that this is carp suitable and that's kind of the reason for the hook choice there. If you want to tie it in lighter hook ranges just because you don't really need the, the strength for a carp or something like that, uh, or especially if you're tying it in a smaller size like a 14 or you know even if you wanted to kind of mix sizes and go to a 12 and you don't need something that heavy, that's not a problem. You could use any other kind of jig hook you wanted. Um, just use what you got, that's the, the number one thing there um, you know a 413 from Tiemco or a 403 either of those would be totally fine um, I'm gonna add a small tungsten bead to the front uh, take note here this is not a jigged bead this is just a standard round tungsten bead it's not slotted uh, it's small enough it just kind of sits up there uh, kind of in that little uh, you know that little bitty tiny neck on the hook there it just kind of makes that corner and rounds that out so this is just a 764 or 2.8 you know, somewhere in that neck of the woods. You can change it uh, as you see fit. I'm tying with 10 aught Vivas today in just kind of a tan color. Uh, so again, nothing fancy, just standard thread. No gel spun here or anything like that. Just building up a small little thread bump there right behind the bead. And then we're going to add that second set of eyes. These are small size brass dumbbells. I'm gonna make a few wraps one direction and then I'm gonna make a few wraps another direction, just kind of, it's not quite a figure eight, it's just kind of a crisscross. Uh, figure eight would be more like this, where you're kind of going back and forth, back and forth. Um, but I, I typically do a lot one direction and then a lot the next. Once I'm done with that, I'm gonna shove those eyes up. Pardon me for moving my hook a little bit. I tend to heavy hand everything here. I'm gonna stick this sucker in the groove. Make sure that, we'll use the Dynaking for what it's for. I'm gonna just put the wood to that set of eyes and cram those up there as close to the bead as I can. So I'm shoving those things with my fingers as far up as I can, getting them there. And then the final step before I move on in the fly is to actually make those frapping wraps, which basically go around that set of eyes and I pull tight. Once I've done that, those are gonna be very, very secure. They're not going anywhere. That's what we're after. I'm gonna simply migrate the thread rearwards, kind of over where, if there was a barb on this hook, where that would be located. We're gonna take our squirrel zonker. This is just squirrel zonker. Or you can use micro or standard depending on uh, what you intend as far as final fly size. If you tie it down, I usually uh, give myself a little bare spot on that strip there where I'll pluck this clean um, to where it basically the fur is only coming out of the stuff that's gonna be exposed. I'll pull a bare spot on that and then I'm gonna simply tie this in all the way into the bend of the hook. Make sure that's exactly where we want it. That's looking pretty good right there, just on the absolute bottom of this hook. And just tie the rest of that down. All is well and good. So now we got a little squirrel tail. That's looking nice. If we need to trim it shorter for any reason, we certainly can do so after the fact. Uh, this guy looks a touch long, but we'll, we'll kind of inspect that following all the rest of this. 
The very next step is to take some copper wire. Um, we're gonna rib the fly with, so just some good uh, olive copper wire. Um, again, brand matters not, it's functionality here. Um, you can do this however you want to. If you have a way you like tying on wire, go for it. This is just how I do it. I normally tie mine down the length of the body just to where I know it's not gonna pull out at any point during the fly tying process. It also, kind of like a woolly bugger, how you try to uh, distribute the materials over the hook evenly versus tying everything in right there at the bend to where you avoid that bump of thread back there. I know we're gonna cover it up with dubbing. It just makes me feel good. And you know, if it makes me happy, I tend to wanna do it. All right. Very next step in this is going to be adding two colors of dubbing. Let me see if I can get both these visible for y'all. It's going to be an orange one for kind of that uh, abdomen hot spot. Then we're going to run to kind of this real dark olive. The colors here that I'm using, this is that SLF Helgramite for the olive color. And this is a near enough crayfish orange for that little orange pop at the end. So we're going to start by adding a little orange pop. And again, general rule of dubbing if you are unaware of it. Take what you think you need, cut it in half, and then cut it in half again, and you probably have about as much as you're gonna need to do the job. So all I'm gonna do is just make a little orange dubbing noodle right there. That's it. That's all I need. We can always add more. It's harder to take it away than it is to add it. And then here's kind of the neat part. We're gonna just simply take this, and th the fun part is you gotta try to get the two to, to actually blend. So if you'll look, if you kind of put those right next to each other, you're trying to blend them and to get where you have a pretty, you know, pretty good blend from one to the next to where there's not a gap in your dubbing noodle. And that looks pretty good. You can see that they're touching. We don't want a, a gap there in between. And this should probably be enough. I might even got a little handed, heavy handed here. We'll see what happens. Like I said, I can always add more. Start out just by making that little abdomen bump here. That's it. And then you'll see we transition right into that right there. And that looks really, really good. I am gonna need just a little bit more. I want this, that's a little too much right there. I'm just kind of manipulating that back and forth. Look at that, it actually turned out just perfect. I thought I was gonna need more, I think we're good. Take your wire, I typically tend to counter rib this, where you're simply going to rib it in the opposite direction of whatever your thread was wrapped in. So here, all I'm doing is just counter ribbing that. I want that a little straighter, it just makes me feel good when I get it right. Again, it's all about my feelings, folks. Come in here. Once I'm done with that, I can then cross the thread over to form that tie down point. And that's all we're gonna need there. Now, as far as you can cut copper wire if you want to, you are more than welcome to do so. I tend to like the method of spiraling it around. If you do so enough, and this is pretty stout wire, it will break. And that is now broken off at the tie in point, make a couple of securing wraps, and we are pretty good to go. Just to cover our tracks a little bit, and because we've left ourselves a little bit more room there, I am gonna add a little bit more dubbing. I know we're gonna be adding a lot of thread and legs and things like that, but I wanna have a little bit of a dubbing base, not much, that's even a little bit much. I just want a little bit there for me to have, um, I just don't like the stuff laying directly on thread in this next step. I like to have the dubbing there, to have a little bit more bite, keeps things from rotating around. I'm just, it makes me, again, a little happier. I feel better about it. And that's exactly what we're after in terms of security there. It's gonna give this material a little bit more, uh, the materials we're gonna add, it's gonna give them a little bit more bite and something to hold on to. So that's something that I want uh, in this. The very next step is we're gonna add these uh, legs called daddy long legs. And daddy long legs are, I'm gonna be honest, they're kind of a pain to work with. They're, they're very small, they're pretty unruly most of the time. Uh, so just be aware that they, they, they're kind of a pain but they look amazing. I'm just prepping a bunch where I've got clean ends on that side, mostly clean ends on the other. I'll trim these up to where they're pretty even. Um, but there's gonna be a lot of trimming coming up, but first steps first, I'm gonna add these right in the center. Just kind of cross over that with my thread and you'll see I've got a bunch hanging out the back. There's a bunch hanging out the front. I'm gonna take this other bunch and, and if you'll notice here, I think I can show this because the way that they're trimmed, I kind of rolled them over to make a V. And you see how the, the legs kind of sit off both sides right here. That's, that's pretty cool because then when you're done with this, you make a couple of wraps and your work here is done. You then take your legs, pull them up like this, get them in a pretty even bunch. Again, I told you they're unruly. 
trim those little buggers. I had one get away. <clears throat> Once we do that, flare those out, and we've got this nice, neat bunch of legs going everywhere. If you've got a few that are poking out the front and you don't like that, great, no problem. Make a few thread wraps, and it forces them rearward. That's all we need right there, is just that little bunch of legs kind of shrouding the entire hook. Not, it's not too bad. I know they're unruly, but you're gonna live, I promise. It's not that bad. The very next thing that we're going to do is add these silicone rubber legs. And this is a uh, grizzly olive in a nymph size. I intentionally went down to the fly bins, got one of these. We do sell this fly in store. I got one and counted the silly legs on it. There are five. I'm, I've never seen an insect with five legs. Now, with that being said, I don't know if one was missing. I don't know if people are just tying clumps of legs on at the factory. But the way that I look at this is these legs come in a hank. The hank has this many legs on it. I don't know how many that is. I haven't counted. Y'all can count this if you want to freeze frame the video, go right ahead. All I know is instead of me counting out individual legs and going, I'm going to just be extremely exacting on this, I would rather just take a clump of legs off the hank and I'm going to tie those in right on the top side of this hook. That's where they're going to go. While pinching that, I'm going to move these into position because I want them to be on the absolute top of the hook here. That when I let go, if you'll see, all those legs kind of splay over the front of the fly. Now, with thread tension, this is important. Keep your thread under tension, pull these legs up, and then get a couple of thread wraps in front to where you are guaranteed right there that I still have tension throughout the trimming process. I stretch the legs a little bit, give a pull, and then at that point, I'm guaranteed they haven't slipped under the thread, everything looks good, but I don't have a bunch of little leg bits sticking everywhere that I don't want. What this winds up giving me is when you tease all this stuff out, you have all these legs splayed out all over the place, they look amazing. That is exactly what we want. The final step on the fly is actually pretty straightforward. It's just a couple of wraps of a soft hackle. So here, um, y'all y'all know my, my Whiting Farms fetish. So Whiting Farms, Hebert Miner, this is a wild type. If you want the label and the numbers and all that, I can probably stick that up there. Let's see if I can get that to show right there. There we go. Hebert Miner, Hen Saddle, Wild Type Brown. Basically, the best looking Hen Saddle you ever saw in your life. They're so good looking. I absolutely love it. Now, a couple of thoughts. If you will notice, with a Hen Saddle feather, there's the really beautiful barred speckled side, then there's this kind of fluffy craziness. If you want more motion, you can pull off most of the downy and leave a little fluffy if you want to. The manufactured version of this fly uses partridge, it looks like. That or another hen saddle that's just kind of speckled. You can get hen saddles that just have that speckling, uh, like on a Brahma, for instance. You can use Brahma or partridge to copy the original. This is going to be fished in front of fish in really clear water. And that's the beauty of fly tying is you get to do stuff that, you know, it's your call. You can do whatever you want. I'm going to take this and make a couple of wraps. I'm going to add just a little bit more right here. I want you to look at where I've divided this. I've kind of made myself a little notch there that I'm going to get rid of the tip of the feather, but I'm going to tie it in right there in that notch. So once this is tied in, I'm going to pull this back. Make a thread wrap up here just to keep everything safe and sound. Trim that tip section off very carefully. Once I've done so, another securing wrap there. Uh, you know, I have some very good friends, and, and I can, I can I, believe it or not, I do have friends. I know that's shocking to most of you out there. Um, but the thing that's interesting about this is they, some of them are exceptional fly tires, and many of them better than I. The thing that I thought was funny is uh, if you ever listen to uh, Dutch, Boffman up in uh, Dallas, he has a thread control class. And one of the things that he stresses is that every single thread wrap must have a purpose. I, I am not that person and I, I should be better. Uh, one of these days I'll, I'll grow up and, and probably have a little bit better control over myself. But at this point, I do what's called paranoid wraps. And, and that's the point where I just, I put more thread on there because I'm paranoid. And as a result, my flies don't really fly, fall apart, but I just, I get paranoid. And so if you see me making wraps and there, there's really no good reason for it, it it's for my emotional well-being. That, that's really all it is. So here I'm trying to stroke this hackle back as much as I can, 
trying not to entrap too many of the fibers. And don't worry, this is tied in just kind of standard soft tackle. Notice right there, we just hit the downy. See that downy material that just flared right there? All we're doing is that. Now, little key here, if you have anything that gets wrapped, you can take a bodkin or a little tip on your whip finisher. I had a couple of fibers right there that got caught. And again, that's due to my ineptitude, I'm sure. But with this point, at that point, I'm gonna simply take this, pull that stuff back, try to slick it back as much as I can. And those hackle pliers are still under tension. And I've, I've, since it's only on the quill there, on the rachis itself, I don't really have to worry too much about entrapment of feathers because I ran out of feather. I don't really have to worry about all that. So now at this point, I just don't want to trap anything with my thread. My work here is done. I'm going to give a couple of securing thread wraps there, or you know, maybe a, there might be a paranoid wrap in there. You never know. But that's the, that's the whole idea right there. At that point, I'm right here behind the eyes. I'm simply going to come up and over and get behind the bead again. So now I am completely clear of all materials. I'm gonna come in here and trim that little rachis off or the quill, whatever you wanna to refer to it as. Got a couple of strays in there I want out. And now I have got a fluffy, a really lovely, fluffy Texas tickler. So we're gonna tie this with the downy version. I'll show you the non-downy. I tied the one that I showed in the first was a non-downy, but I just, I love showing people things that make flies move more and just, I don't know. They, it, again, it just makes me happy. That's all there is to it. After that, your work here is done. This looks awesome. Throw a little whip finish there right behind the bead. You can throw a second one if you want to. I would recommend it just for safety's sake. Again, watching out for that soft hackle, it's going to want to move. So don't worry about it. Just tie that in nice and neat. Slide the scissors down, trim it as close as you can. Stroke everything back. What you have is a Texas tickler in all of its glory. Now, the non-fluffy version, just to compare side by side, you will notice, let me see if I can set this on top of the other there. You'll see it's a little bit more sparse. You're gonna have a little bit more of a see-through profile on it. This one is gonna fall ever so slightly slower because you're gonna have more water resistance because of that downy material, but it's also gonna breathe a little bit more. And when you're in crystal clear water, like on the South Fork of the San Gabriel or something of that sort, um, breathing flies are very important. I'm gonna make this tail just a smidge shorter. Another little tip here, when you trim squirrel, See how there's that really hard edge on that backside? I take my scissors in and right here, I'm, I'm gonna see if y'all can see this, this is really hard. Right here, see how there's a little tab of skin right there that doesn't have any fur on it. If you'll trim that off and then take that edge. Now look, we've got this nice pointed, we don't really have that hard edge on the backside and I really like that where you don't, where basically everything goes straight to fur. There's no, because uh, when you trim this direction, you're always going to catch a little bit of hair. But I love that right there. So this right here is a finished Texas tickler. I'll let you take one more look around the fly there. Pretty straightforward, not a difficult pattern to tie. Um, amazing, amazing pattern for Central Texas. I highly advocate that you put a couple of these in your box. Uh, if you need the materials or anything like that, of course, we have them here at the fly shop. If you have any questions, happy to answer as best we can. Obviously, if you have any comments or if you have success on the fly, just let us know in the YouTube comments there. And man, we're just so happy to put this stuff out and to get this in front of you. And please let us know if there's any way we can help you in your fly tying or fly fishing journey. That's what we're here for. We wanna educate as much as we can and get you on the water having the best time possible. Thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned for more in the future. We appreciate y'all and have a good time on the water. Take care.